Hi, my name is Tony Delaflor. I'm here today with Leighton Cougar from the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary in uh, Rayma, New Mexico. Thanks for joining us, Leighton. Um, for people who don't know anything about the sanctuary, tell us what it's about. Well, what we do is we rescue captive bred wolves that are sold in the exotic pet trade to be people's pets. And we end up either rescuing them from people who made them pets, or if we're really lucky, we get to rescue the animal before it actually got sold and hit the pet market itself. And then we give those animals a permanent lifetime sanctuary, and then we use our sanctuary as an educational facility so people can come and see a wolf up close to more about them. But not only that, but we also have some wolves that are highly social that we can bring in the public school system and use them as educational tools to teach people and let people see a wolf hands-on so they can have a discovery that the the wolf is not the big bad beast that's going to run up and eat their children, but it's also not a pet. Right. How, tell me, going back to the beginning, what you just said, how, who knew there was even this trafficking in hybrid wolves? How did that, how did you even find out about that? Uh, well, you know, uh, I found out about what this whole phenomenon when I moved into the neighborhood. When I moved into the community I lived in, there was, this project had just started back in 1996. So, and, if, and since then, it's just, you know, exponentially grown. And since we got the internet, you can now buy any wild animal on planet Earth that you can think of with the click of a mouse and a credit card. So it's made the, it, uh, made wild animals very accessible to the general population, you know, because, hey, if, uh, you know, if, if Michael Jackson can have a giraffe, why can't, you know, in a, in a chimpanzee, why can't I have a whatever? You know, so uh, it's just one of those phenomena that's going crazy, primarily due to the internet. Is it, I mean, is it something, you know, that people think, I'm getting this cute, cuddly little pet, and yeah. then they realize totally. it's actually a wild animal? Yeah. Is that uh, why they end up at your place? I don't think they really just suddenly realize it's a wild animal, because that's the intrigue. They buy this cute, cuddly little wolf puppy, and it's so darn cute, and then when it grows up, and it starts consuming mass amounts of food, and digging, you know, giant holes in their backyard, and destroying their entire, you know, living room furniture. And Before you started the sanctuary, what would typically happen to these animals? Typically, the euthanized or you know, super irresponsible people would either let them go in the woods or just keep them in the backyard until they die. Did you? Was there any certain experience or something that you saw one being mistreated or just it just no. wasn't right that got you to start the sanctuary? No, I, I I didn't start the sanctuary. I, I joined forces with two ladies uh, who were already at retirement age who had started this project, and basically. Um, I, I stayed away for the first couple of years because I'm, I'm an animal lover. I didn't want to fall in love and be committed to a bunch of dogs. That was my thought. And then, I, then you know, knowing the, the ladies, I finally showed up one day and said, you know, I think you need my help. And uh, I said, well, let me, have, let me, let me uh, take your volunteers and crack the whip on them on Mondays because I have that day free. And, uh, and they said, oh, no, Monday's their day off. I said, no. I drive by all the time. Every day's their day off. Monday will be the day they work. So I... Uh, I went there, I started cracking the whip, everybody left. <laughs> All the volunteers <laughs> left. So I said, hey, what could I do? I had to stick around and, and help out these animals. And then, in, uh, that was back in 1996, and then in 2003 I took over the company. Before you got into this, did you have any background in dealing with wolves or any type of wild animal? Not wild animals per se, but I was a farm boy, lived in the woods almost the majority of my uh, youth. So, and I just had an affinity towards animals. I, I also volunteered at the LA Zoo as an adult and when I lived in Los Angeles. So, I just, it didn't seem like it was in the second nature. How many, uh, how many uh, wolves do you have out there now? Right now, I think we have 62. 62 wow. wolves and one fox, one red fox. Who just showed up. 62. I and mean, again, most of these were owned by somebody? Yeah, uh, most of them were. We have a few that we luckily were able to acquire before they actually hit the pet trade. We got them from the breeders that were breeding them. Okay. Yeah. Now, I don't know how this works. Do you eventually release them, or is this pretty much a home for This wolves? is it. Permanent lifetime sanctuary. You know, part of my slogan is we never, we never breed, we never buy, we never sell, we never release. We only provide permanent lifetime sanctuary. And what's it cost to do this? this I mean, 62 animals, that's, yeah. that's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, yeah it's money. math, but um, I'm sure somebody watching has a calculator. It's $7 per animal per day okay. uh, at 62 animals just to feed, just to feed. That's not the lights. That's not gasoline. That's just to feed them. Right. And they eat primarily wild game and poultry. And when I buy poultry, I have to buy it by the five or 10,000 pound lots. 
Now, I want to tell you wow. something. This is really important because last year, at the beginning of last year, I bought 10,000 pounds of chicken at 18 cents a pound. By the second purchase of last year, it was 59 cents a pound. I just went to buy this last week is 90 cents a pound. So we went from 18 cents last year to 90 cents a pound this year. So our prices are way up. And I'm taking it, this is not free range chicken. This is just your This is whatever I can find in a bulk amount. Yeah, good old Tyson. Morgan. So you've got to pay, you've got to store all that. You've, yeah. You have a lot of expenses associated yeah. with that. Right? It's not like being in the pound where these yams can be readopted. You Once you take them on, you take them on until their lifespan is their, over. Their whole life. And the, the average lifespan of a wolf in the wild is six to nine years, but in captivity, the average is 14. Wow. What's the biggest misconception that people have about I, there's lots, but I, I think aggression. People obvious, almost always think that wolves are aggressive when they're absolutely, virtually non-aggressive. But when they're very familiar with a human being, they can be dangerous because if now they're living in your home, they consider themselves part of your family and they're going to behave like a wolf would in their family. But both, most people think by nature wolves are vicious, so they're not vicious by nature. But when we take them out of nature, then we have a different dynamics. What are the kind of misconceptions? That it's going to be just like a dog. If it looks like a dog, I can raise it like a dog. It'll act just like a dog. My analogy is, so if that's the truth, then I can take a chimpanzee, raise it like my daughter, it'll grow up to be a supermodel. Nope. It's going to still be a chimpanzee. <laughs> They'll still have that ugly little mug. But, you know, that, but, so a wolf will not grow up and be a dog because they don't have any doggy thoughts, doggy daydreams, or doggy desires. They have no desire to please us. They want to be our equal. They're not, they're, they're not somebody who looks to us and says, Master, tell me what to do. Let me go fetch a ball. Uh-uh. You know, it's uh, give me some food and let me tear up your couch. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll be showing some pictures, but describe what what the sanctuary looks like. I have no idea. You know, does it look like a kennel? Is it an open space? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that's a, that. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, we All of our animals are in compatible pairs. And when I say compatible pairs, that means they get along. What people often think of is that a, uh, a bunch of wolves get together in the woods and they're called a pack. Well, a pack is a family unit. So we can't be rescuing strangers from all over the country and put them in a group of you know, 5, 10, 15. They'll kill each other because they're not related to one another because a pack is a family unit. So we have compatible pairs and family groups in different size habitats throughout our compound. We have 88, 88 acres and we absorb just about 20 acres in, in, in habitats and the rest is buffer all around the property. We also provide a uh, campground in a, in a primitive RV park, and we have a nice little picnic patio, so we encourage people who have to drive a long ways, and to get there, you've got to drive a long ways, no matter how you are, unless you're in Raymer. Yeah. But, uh, so we say pack lunch, sit in our picnic area, let the wolves serenade you while you eat, and then take a great tour throughout our whole facility. We're at 7,500 uh, foot elevation, so the animals are, and it's fully wooded, so the animals are cool all year round, and they've got plenty of trees and, and shrubbery and whatnot to run in rock formation. So it's really cool. So I was going to ask you, describe one of these habitats. What does this look like? Yeah, well, the, the finest habitat, uh, which if people see the Romeo video that I just made of our fox, he's got the best one. It's, you know, it's got a stream running through it and, uh, and grass growing, and, you know, it's really beautiful. But, they, but wolves tear their environment to pieces. If they are out in the wilderness, they're going to be running in a 100 square mile area and they're not going to destroy their environment. But, you know, in 5,000 square feet, a pair can really tear up the environment. So pretty much it's, it's dirt and trees and rocks. And, and all summer long, you know, here in New Mexico, all summer long we get rain. So it's beautifully green. But come wintertime, the, the, you know, the green dies and it's just dirt, rocks, and trees. And the snow comes and it's beautiful. So, yeah, pe people can see from our pictures and our videos that it's really a gorgeous place. So what kind of barrier do you have there that prevents them from going and eating yeah. the visitors? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's a, a nine gauge chain link fence, a minimum of nine and a half foot tall, and we also bury ground wire uh, three feet into the ground so that we prevent them from digging out. We have double gate entry systems so an animal can't escape when you open a gate. You've got to go through one gate, close it, close it, then another gate, close it. We're very professional. We're just like any zoo would be. Now, I assume there's probably some medical costs, veterinary costs type associated yeah. with this. Yeah, there yeah. probably aren't a lot of wolf doctors around, I'm imagining. Yeah, and we have to travel on average. Anyway, we have to travel at least 65 miles to the nearest vet, but we actually typically drive all the way to Albuquerque, uh, all the way to the East Mountains, about 150 miles to a vet that we like there. 
So our bet, but bills also include gasoline and travel. But it's uh, our, currently, uh, you know, with the uh, the amount of elderly animals that we have, we have far more vet bills. So our vet bills average about you know, anywhere from nine to to eighteen thousand dollars a year. Wow. When some when people say Layton, what's your ultimate goal at Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary? The ultimate goal, goal is shut it down, close the doors, lock it up, because we don't have an epidemic in America anymore of people buying and selling and breeding wolves. Do you think Disney's responsible for this? <laughs> why, why do people, people do this with all kinds of animals? Yeah. And they think somehow I'm going to, they're human at some level or whatever, or I'm going to humanize them or I'm going to domesticate them. Where does this idea come from? Well, you know, I don't really know. I wish I did, but, you know, it's, I will try to remind people that, you know, it took thousands of years to get chihuahuas from a wolf. You know, that's domestication. That's a process that happens. Because people often use it, well, he's domestic. No, he's not. He's social to humans. But he's not a domestic animal. The domestic wolf is called a dog. And there's lots of them. And they breed specific, they have breed specific, breed specific behaviors. So we know what we're getting. When we go buy a Labrador retriever, we know his job is to retrieve. And he wants to, he lives for a tennis ball, you know. But when we get a wolf, he lives to be free and wild and on his own and in charge. And you don't want that guy in your house. <laughs> well, two, two other questions here. Um, you mentioned your staff. How many people do you have working out there at the, at the sanctuary? Never enough and no payroll at the moment. So uh, it's tough. I, uh, myself, my wife, and two, two staff members. And I, I'm not really sure right now, maybe a dozen volunteers that live on site. And it, but again, you're saying you pretty much, it's a 24-7 job. Yeah. Totally. So you, somebody's always got to be there. Yeah, we have people that live, um, uh, my two staff members live on site and all my volunteers live on site. Wow. Now where do the wolves come from? Are they all from New Mexico or from all over the country? Or all over the country, uh, from California to Florida, uh, all points in between. Uh, we recently were in Iowa and picked up uh, three wolves from a zoo that was closing down. I really wanted these wolves because they're tundra wolves, and uh, I'd like to be able to show the different subspecies of wolves at the sanctuary. I don't want to just, you know, uh, rescuing is very important. Education is highly important, and the best way to educate people is to have the different subspecies so we can demonstrate to them you know, what they look like, what their different characteristics are, and that sort of thing. How do those wolves fit into the high desert climate? None of them do, but, <laughs> but you know, they're breeding Arctic wolves in southern Texas. You know, we, uh, you know, what kind of nonsense is that? They're breeding Arctic wolves in Georgia and Florida, uh, so far removed from their environment, and people think it's okay to have a, an Arctic wolf in their backyard in, in south Texas. Well, yeah, that's, that's hell on an animal that, that needs to be in you know, 30 to 20 below uh, temperatures. The, the, the Michael Vick case uh, last year obviously brought a lot of attention to sure. bringing of pit bulls and fighting and stuff like that. It sounds to me like there's not that same public awareness of what's going on with this breeding of... of you know, there, it, it, I suppose if a celebrity did something heinous with a wolf, we could get the public aware, an awareness <laughs> we need. But it takes somebody like him to, you know, to bring awareness to people, and it shouldn't be that way. We should... There are, you know, there's soldiers uh, uh, out there, there's, you know, there's... There's uh, what it was the term they used for Steve Irwin, you know, um, a warrior for the wild or whatever. You know, there's a lot of diligent people out there trying to stop a lot of this stuff, but nobody wants to listen until a, a Michael Vick shows up. You know, somebody, a famous person that we can point our finger at and say, "Ooh, he's bad." And now suddenly there's awareness. Or if Oprah gets you on their show, on her show, then suddenly there's a boatload of awareness. Um, so far, Oprah hasn't called. And I've called her plenty of times. <laughs> Well, um, fascinating story. Any last thing you want to say to the viewers here? About I just, yeah, the, the last thing is check out our website often, uh, www.wildspiritwolfsanctuary.org, and check out all the great videos that I have, and then more than ever, come see us, see what we do. Get us into your school, your club, your church, your group, do an educational program. And if they want to support this uh, effort, what can they do? It's, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that we can give you a, a contribution receipt and get tax deductions on your donation. Let's go to our website and donate right to the website or simply just send us a check. Okay. Just that easy. All right. Well, Layton, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Great story. All right.